Hello there, friends. Before we jump into it, uh, if you like what we do here on cpdh.guide, the YouTube, uh, and you want to support us in a free way, because, you know, that's what friends do, hit that like, hit that subscribe, even share the damn thing. All right, on to the show. Hello and welcome. If you do not know who this gentleman is, then, well, I don't want to be friends. That's just yeah no seriously i have with me the winner second time winner of the sanctuary open season this was what season three or uh, yeah. season three yeah. season three um with a different deck so i have with me mr gator bait tv that's sir to you uh <laughs> thank you for joining me uh i'm I was kind of hopeful that the roles would been reversed, <laughs> but it didn't. It didn't work out that way. But you know, here we go. Yep. Uh, uh, I as, get it. I get it. As as per the, well, I was going to say as per usual, but um, like I did last time uh, when when Caitlin won, his daughter Mini CJ won. Uh, I was like, hey, anybody secure the interview? And he goes, no. And I was like, let me get it. <laughs> so uh yeah. thanks for indulging me uh i know we're not the biggest uh uh venture on this side of the fence dot guide but it's a it's a great home for it considering uh what we're trying to do on this you know on this thing so yeah um sanctuary open series you know number three um what was now this was the biggest one to date we had 21 people sign up we had one pe person not show so we ended up with 20 so uh five pods of four uh, we kind of knew it was going to be bigger than the last of the previous ones coming into this um what i want you to kind of uh, give the people right because the people want to know is what your expectations were kind of leading it in the week leading up to this and then like like minute one of the event itself. And then from there, uh, uh, we'll kind of reconvene and we'll talk about your individual matches. But like, I think you have an inter I personally think that you have an interesting perspective on this, especially this tournament leading up to it. Cause we talked in the days mm -hmm. leading up to it. Like I want, I want them to see your perspective. Mm -hmm. I want them to know kind of like your thought processes, how you were approaching the thing. So, please. Well, you know, the the most fantastic part about this tournament, and one reason why I think this tournament saw so many people to begin with, in retrospect, one, it's the third one, but two, Bobby B. Fine, shout out to Bobby B. Fine um, in the Sanctuary, he actually went out of his way to be able to change the timeline to allow other players to play in the event and they showed up mm -hmm. um very depressingly one of them did have uh difficulties and they had to drop mm. in, a, in a round technical issues and, yeah yep yep so like that was super depressing um they did have a win as well and that was like super depressing because they were doing really well in the event mm -hmm. and you know was what it was but i from like people talking to me and leading up to it, I couldn't believe the words that I was hearing leading up to like the one or two days prior to the event. We're like, yeah, I'm going to bring this deck. Yeah, I'm going to bring this deck. And I was like running through my brain. I was like, wait a minute, is everybody bringing a different deck? And then I was like, oh my gosh, as soon as the event started, my first inclination was, I wonder what everybody's playing because to the best of my knowledge, Everyone is playing a different deck, and this is so exciting. In my round one, holy guacamole, I will tell you this without a shadow of a doubt, I was not expecting to see what I saw, and I was, I was dumbfounded. So allow me to drill down on that a little bit. So um, uh, I'm going to link the, the Sanctuary bookmark of all the deck lists that uh, participated there was only one duplicate, but they had, it was Abdel, but they had different, it was Sword Coast Sailor and Agent. So two different mm -hmm. versions of Abdel, and that's the only repeat. So you had 20. Well, I mean, we, 
we had Malcolms. The, the same with Malcolms. Oh, yeah, yeah, they Malcolms, were yeah. Malcolm yeah, Arden, but they were also Malcolm, different. Right. But yeah, Malcolm oh. Arden, Malcolm Rog, Malcolm Kettis. Oh, like, Malcolm Rog, yes. So, right. Yeah, it's, there were so many different ones, mm-hmm. right? Like, even though it's the same, is it? It's not the same. Those the closest, lists, the closest yeah. two would have been uh, Kettis and Rog. One's the turbo version. One's the more redundant, uh, which I have. Uh, turbo? <laughs> yeah. It's a, yeah. So, so before we move on, um, uh, highlighting the fact that this tournament had 20 unique lists, uh, no copies, no carbon. I mean, there were some similar ideas, but you know, I digress. So, um, so I'm going to, I'm going to try to elicit some free coaching advice from my man, uh, Gator. Cause if you don't know, uh, Gator <laughs> offers, uh, coaching and other stuff. I can put links to that if he has them uh, in the description to that. Or just ping him on Discord, harass him. Uh, So the background that uh, Chris and I share uh, allows us the opportunity to see information at a glance and then have decision-making processes uh, regarding that information. So, uh, and he knows exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, So, in talking to other players, uh, you probably get a sense of like who's going to be participating. You know probably what they're going to be playing. I'll let you take it from there. Well, I mean, there's no reason to lie about it, though, right? Mm-hmm. Like, there, there's so many of us in the community, and we're very honest about like what we mm-hmm. do and you know what we what we want to try. Like Islane, uh, the possibility storm. He's a prime example of it. He. He goes into the event and he describes like, hey guys, I'm going to play Sivirus. Mm. Understand, I will be going into the event with this deck. And that's that's very respectful. Like, you know what you're getting into. Mm. And you know this individual is trying to do what they're doing with that. Mm. And it's very good to see players doing the deed, right? Mm. Like, without that player playing the deck repetitively, mm. we're never going to understand certain logistics behind the deck, right? Mm. and similar similar to me right like i'm one of those players that is like uh i think this deck is good all right i'm gonna play the deck now and i'm gonna demonstrate why i think the deck is good will fail i have failed miserably um i have a recent failure with a deck (laughs) um that we mean you have uh spoken Mm -hmm. about uh that was quite a horrendous showing um Mm -hmm. never took it to a tournament obviously but Mm -hmm. uh I wanted to, and you know, I'm a big fan of players that are willing to put themselves out there and truly play mm-hmm. the decks that they feel are worth it. So yeah, the uh, I wasn't meaning anything illicit like, ooh, we're studying, we're gaming the system. Uh, for those of you listening out there, don't uh, don't at me with that uh, that bull. Um, there's two things that, uh, uh, and Chris and I have talked about this previously, uh, players that play their list, and in fact, uh, they just did an episode on regarding this uh, for Common Theory, players that play their deck inside and out know it back to front, blah, blah, blah. It's not necessarily that that creates a detriment for the list itself. In fact, <laughs> that heightens the skill level that that player is bringing with those lists. It also informs what you need to expect when you're playing in these pods. So if you expect a Sivirus uh, and your deck is weak to Sivirus, maybe there's an opportunity there to shore up that matchup if you decide to do that. So uh, Chris is kind of a master when it comes to looking at these pieces and he's doing the humble quiet thing right now. So. I'll, I'll let him keep doing that. But uh, looking at the pieces in the week leading up to this and talking to all the players and having an idea, you know, Dallas's puzzle was showing up. He's going to be playing Gretchen, you know, like uh, James uh, uh, Yami was likely going to be playing his uh, agent uh, or uh, uh, Abdel agent. Like, you know, these players, but that's the thing, knowing what they're going to, be playing is not going to um, 
lessen. Well, it's not going to sway. My, yeah, it's yeah. not going to sway my decisions if right. I can interrupt you for mm-hmm. a moment. Like mm-hmm. I, I've never let that sway my decisions of what I wanted to play. Like in the original Sanctuary series, if I can move all the way back to that, mm-hmm. I told everyone I was going to play Abdel Adrian. In the weeks leading up, I wasn't actually even going to play in the event, and I ended up playing in the event. Mm-hmm. And I had been playing that deck all the way leading up, playing that deck with everyone demonstrating how powerful the deck was. And they were like, yeah, this deck is good. And I'm like, yeah, I know. So I'll keep playing it. And then I ended up in the event and I was like, you know what? I said I would play it if I was in it. So Mm -hmm. here I am. I'm going to play the deck. So, and it was the same situation, like uh, friends of mine and like just, you know, acquaintances and other people that I speak to, they were like, hey, you're playing. I was like, I am. I'm horrible at signing up for the event, but I'm playing. 90% 90% of it, I'm going to be playing Malcolm Kettis. Um, If for some crazy reason I'm able to get the cards for Malcolm Arden, mm-hmm. I'm going to play Malcolm Arden. And my one buddy, which was a Chinaman, which did top four with Malcolm Arden, and it is on stream where he beat me up <laughs> horrendously in a round. They only got to see the oh. end of that round. But he destroyed me in that round. Um, yeah. So before we get into like your round specifically, uh, allow me to humble brag for you a little bit. So the last winner, Sanctuary Series Open Series 2, is your daughter on a deck that you and her both co-authored. So I'm, yes. trying, I'm trying to establish a trend. Uh, the first Sanctuary Series, you won on a deck that you authored. Third, yes. third sanctuary series. Not only did you win with a deck that you had authored, but also in the top four pod, there was uh, your influence in some of those other decks. I think, I think uh, David's uh, Ankylosaur's Seder is probably the only deck that you didn't have input on in that top four. Correct. I'm a co-author on Chinaman's list. That was actually the list that I. I wanted to play in the event and I was unable to get the cards to play in the event with. So I wanted to play that allow me, exact list. <laughs> allow me to humble brag for you. You know, Sanctuary 1, Sanctuary 2, Sanctuary 3 has your influence all over it. And it's because of that, which is why I wanted to bring up, you know, maybe some of your preparation you know, you don't really look into detail what people are playing, uh, but that's still a valid option if a person wants to take that and prepare that way. Uh, but if they're settled on a list, you know, knowing what the competition could be is not disadvantageous is what I'm getting at. But also recognizing that uh, these other players, if they say they're bringing their signature deck, then you're probably going to have a game on your hands. So preparing in that way. So, uh, yeah, definitely. So, uh, allowing me, I think I, uh, I think I said all the, uh, all the parts you didn't say out loud. (laughs) Well, I got you. I got you. So like, so, so with that though, so realistically, right. Like, um, people like a Chinaman, he's in, uh, similar to my daughter, like we all play in person Mm -hmm. and none of us, are how do I, how do I say this nicely? We <laughs> this is the nicest thing, nicest way I could say it. We don't take any shenanigans from each other. Mm-hmm. We're there to win the game, um, and we are going to beat each other. If we see each other in a tournament setting, we've done this for years now. We look at each other and go, "I'll have dinner with you tomorrow, my bro," mm-hmm. but today you're losing this game. Mm-hmm. And when I ended up facing Chinaman in rounds, what was it? Round three, I was terrified. I was like, this is probably my worst match of the day. And it went as such, and he just wiped the floor with me. He was just like, Gator, you know your deck is not good again. And I was like, yeah, you're right. (laughs) And he just mopped the floor with me. And it was like, uh, I actually ended up going back and watching uh, the VOD that uh, mm-hmm. Bobby B. Fine put out. 
and you could it, it's very easily illustrated it shows up like partly through towards the end of the game and you just see china man just have his way with all of us towards the end of that match and it was he he was unstoppable in that match so that so. was a uh, which match was that that was your was uh that? round three so round three so what was your first what was your we didn't we never played each other so we were we did not know so we were we were separated uh by the bracket so what 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 was your first match tell me tell me about that in fact i think that was your longest one at 11 turns we were a few minutes before time mm -hmm. in that match um i actually had a great opportunity to play with lobert um that was actually the first conversation i ever had with lobert and the first game i ever had with lobert um, I never knew that Lobbert did not like combo decks until <laughs> that moment in time. Um, it was uh, very new to me. Not new in the sense of uh, not liking the combo decks, but just, you know, his perspective on it was uh, very gotta get Gator off the table. Not directed towards me, but more directed towards the deck itself. Mm -hmm. And yeah, at no point did I have control of the game. Um, Cardor was controlling the entire game. Uh, I was playing against some very unique decks. Um, I had Rakdos seat one. I was seat two. Um, Orzoff was seat three, and the, the uh, Mono White was seat four. The yep. Aristocrats deck. Yeah. Um, actually, it was a Voltron deck. Um, it it was a very unique list. Um, it it it's it was slower to start but once it got going it was able to always get through an opponent because its commander cartel aristocrat was able to give itself protection mm -hmm. um so it was very unique and honestly it was loads of fun to watch play but it had issues against cardor because of what cardor was doing so cardor was just making everyone attack everyone else and keeping all of our boards clean so we all of us ran into issues and Cardor made it a point to be the mono white player because I was just kind of left to the side as everyone was beating up on me and I end up pulling it out by it wasn't that they left me alone but it was just like I was the weakest link of the table and Cardor has to kind of have me at the table mm -hmm. because without me at the table the goad feature isn't as relevant. And then the cartel aristocrat player actually went to kill me. Mm -hmm. And when they went to kill me, I was like, dude, if you kill me, I can't I, like, I please don't try. I'm saving what I have for a car door. They were like, yeah, but I can hit you right now and get you off the table. And I bolted them straight to the dome and they were two life. And I was like, look, I'm sorry. This was meant for car door. I didn't want this according, situation to happen. According to Aaron, you wasted one damage. Uh, he's not honestly he's not wrong i i really do agree with that sentiment truth be told i really do I, like i really do i like that is a weird thing that aggro players really have every point of damage matters mm. and i get it because there's so many games where you lose at one yep. life and your opponent's at one and they're looking at you in the face and be like wow you couldn't do one point of damage mm. nice try so you you bolted the uh, aristocrat guy, and what did that? Where did that leave you? Um, it gave me a quick window to go back around the table, and it let me. It kind of gave me a little breath of life again because it saved me a lot of damage. Actually, quite a bit of damage. Like I believe it was six life. It saved me, so I was able to actually take a hit because they were goaded. I was able to take a hit from Lobbert and then Cardor continued its assault at Lobbert mm. because the problem, Lobbert is in a combo deck with his mono white, which he actually did a really good video speaking about the deck and everything um, that I had watched, ironically, right prior to the tournament. <laughs> um, but do your homework. He, uh, <laughs> well, you know, it was, it was it was kind of ironic that I had just watched it right before the tournament. And he had gained so much life throughout the game that Carter could not beat him. It was irrelevant that I was a combo deck. It was relevant that his life gain did not allow Carter to win the game. 
and it didn't matter what I was. It mattered that Lobber can like every creature the Lobber played. Like there was a one two Pegasus that was doing work throughout the entire game, and it mattered. Mm-hmm. Hands down, it mattered, and it just continued to make Lobber the threat. And he was one attack for like I don't know five or six turns away from getting lethal commander damage. Just every single turn, he was pressured because of how relevant the life gain was. Hmm. So, and you, you closed it out with, uh, I assume, a, a pirate ping type combo. I did, I did. Um, <laughs> I played. I mean, it's a good assumption. <laughs> I, I played it. I, I, well, I played a bit of possum. Um, I had half of it in my hand. I had two halves in my hand, and I threw one half in play and let them kill it all. Yeah, and I was like, guys, I have literally nothing, which is true. That you just killed my combo, and I only had one other piece in the deck, but it was in my hand. Mm-hmm. I was like, you killed it. They're like, we did, but the other half was in my hand. Mm-hmm. So, kind of was what it was. I was just waiting for the pirate changing card because I had the ingenious artillerist in my hand, and they killed the fire weaver. So, righteous. So that was your longest game at 11 turns, and understandably, because you had the, uh, now that I know, you had the control deck at the table uh, with with some mid-range or aggro components there. Uh, oh, so, yeah, definitely. So your second match, drastic decrease in number. So this one ended in uh, five, like five or nine turns, something like that. I think it was, I don't have it written down. Two. Was round two. That was David Punks and my daughter. Was round two. Uh, that was a horrendous game for me. <laughs> um, I almost. That was my worst match of the day. Um, if you guys don't realize this already, um, everyone is allowed to make a mistake. I've said that a million times, and I essentially almost lost the game to myself. Mm-hmm. Truth be told, I played Crimson Wisp. I set everything up on my board to win the game. I executed the win. And then when I did it, Kunks goes, I have a standard bear. And I was like, yeah, I know that. (laughs) And I proceeded to do my thing. And he goes, it targets my standard bear. And I was like, okay, uh uh-huh, uh-huh. And then I agreed with him and then allowed the play to happen. And then like two seconds later, I was like, why did I do that? I knew what I was doing, I executed it, I went to Spellbomb after. Well, you, you're, burying, realized- you're burying the lead, so why was... Uh, so Standard Bearer is a Flag Bearer, and it's one of the two creatures available to us that say any spell or ability that can target this, that an opponent controls, must target a Flag Bearer. A Flag Bearer. Yes, so um, I had an Amiiboy Changeling and I targeted which, the Amiiboy Changeling, is... a flag bearer. <laughs> so I targeted the Amiiboy Changeling with a Crimson Wisp to give it haste to target my Fire Weaver to win the game. And I targeted it. Then I used the Spell Bomb to bounce the flag bearer so I could target the Fire Weaver. Mm-hmm. But then when he said what he said, my brain disappeared. Mm-hmm. I mean, it is what it is. Like, we all make mistakes, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and I made that mistake. Luckily, I was able to rebuild from there and proceed to win. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, I... If if you guys think I don't make a mistake, you're highly mistaken. <laughs> well, I mean, by that time... Um, we, so this We is, all make mistakes. So, so this is round two, and I, I can't speak for you or anybody else, but if you're human like I am, like the hour before a tournament, like my, my stomach is like going crazy. Like I, you know, I need to make sure that I've used the restroom, that I've had some food, that I've done my prep, but I'm still like, you know, anxious going into this thing. Cause I'm excited. I want to engage in the, you know, in the camaraderie, the, the battle, you know, all that stuff. So if you're anything like oh, I am, you know, then like you're already exhausted by the time the first round is set up and then you know there's the 30 minutes of getting everybody situated and then the round and all that stuff so by the time you got to that point where you made the targeting and then you know kunk spoke up we're talking like three or four hours in so oh yeah well 
it it didn't help that my daughter went turn one Dargo. <laughs> and all of us looked at each other like, um, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we, we all did one of these and pointed at each other. Like, did anyone mulligan for interaction? Because we didn't assume seat four would have the turned one like nut draw. Mm -hmm. So can anyone help each other out? Yeah. Kind of thing. So, so, so. Watch th watching that uh, finish up on stream. You know, you you were able to string together. I think everybody in the world it felt like was watching that happen. Uh, you were, you were able to string together when, thank God, <laughs> you pulled it out. Uh, so round three. This is the one you were talking about earlier with the uh, Chinaman. Oh, that was whose name is that was Kevin? Massacre. Whose name is Kevin? Yes. Uh, I'm not saying something that I shouldn't be saying. Don't at me, YouTube. That's his. That's his nickname. Yeah, that is his. That is literally his nickname. Self. He goes by that. Yep. They. That's his thing. I've gone through this so many times. He loves when you call him China Man, just like I love being called Gator. So, that's his nickname. Yep. Now that that's out of the way, he obliterated all of us that game. Okay. Um. But you still had to. Uh like two wins, 10 points. Uh, you were still firmly in the first position in the first place in the pole position in the rankings uh, at that right. point. So you could, uh, you could afford well, that. That game was relatively unique. Um, I do want to talk about that game. So similar to game one, there was a ton of interaction prior to turn four. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm talking about like just sack effects, uh, direct kill cards, like just, Game one was all interaction, and it was just I had to win at the last two or three minutes of that game. Game round two was just like I'm ending you interaction, not have you know kill spells, but I'm just going to take you off the table interaction. Mm -hmm. And in game three, I had used by turn three, I had used a thunderclap, a lightning bolt, a fire ice, and a there was something else I had used. I believe an echoing truth or something along those lines. I don't remember everything, but we had used so much interaction. And fighting, oh, Wings of Ellis it was actually, believe it or not, part of my interaction, not trying to win the game. I was actually trying to keep Malcolm alive mm -hmm. from getting uh, bolted because it turned into a 4 4 mm -hmm. and didn't work. I mean, we had dazes, bolts. You name it, no one had anything by turn five. And for the record, now um, I will, some, myself and other people who have who played in the tournament have kind of talked, and uh, your experience with the interaction was actually somewhat unique. It was uh, uh, most other folks, uh, okay. like there was like one or two, like in my matches, I only played three before I dropped in my matches. I was the deliverer of a early piece of removal. And I was the recipient in another game of another piece of early removal outside of that. Uh, people pretty much developed their game plans. So your experience is kind of unique in the fact that there was, uh, so this is something that will probably myself puzzle and Jonathan will talk about, uh, uh, in the like metadata stuff, but like um, relative to this, I I know we're going on a little bit of an aside here, but uh, I I posted some preliminary stats in the uh, uh, the uh, data analysis channel of Doc Guy Discord, and um, what was it? So the tournaments, the winning the winning turns happened uh on average uh on turn 7.3 i know the point three doesn't matter much but it, it's just there's an indicator of saying you know greater than seven versus less than seven instead of like 6.9 or something like yep. that but like turn seven so in the realm of the larger data for this year we're looking at an average of turn nine in fact that was the last it could be different now but an average of turn nine so if this tournament is firing off on average by turn seven, that's a full two turns greater than the average. 
So um, those early plays where I feel like in your games where those people were interacting, like um, uh, I played against Chinaman uh, in one of my matches, and he deployed a Malcolm, and like at the end of the preceding turn, bolt, you know, like uh, my favorite thing to do is to bolt a, ma uh, um, uh, a Malcolm like right after somebody played it. Like when all their mana's tapped and all that stuff, that's my favorite thing to do. Because as a Malcolm player, I know what a tempo swing that actually is for that deck. So Malcolm decks, mm -hmm. are, Malcolm decks are typically really fast. So by setting you off a turn or two, you know, now I'm allowing the opportunity to develop my, I'm also allowing the opportunity for the other two players to develop their board. But depending on the pod uh, composition, that may or may not be a bad thing. But uh, that's kind of one of the reasons why I wanted to hint it on the, uh, the early interaction, because all the rest of us uh, that I know of weren't experiencing that. So you were uh, kind oh, of... Yeah. All right. So not only <laughs> that makes it that makes it even more impressive the fact that uh, you in your pods were experiencing the correct amount of interaction and yet you were still able to persevere uh, and and push through that stuff. So, I mean, if if I, if I may, yeah. um, I was completely bullied in round one. I yeah, mean, as well they you were should, you jerk, bullying me <laughs> round one. And I mean, they were making it a point to do it. Yeah. Like the, there was a point where Lobbert goes, we need to take him off the table. And I was like, wow, mm -hmm. really? And I was like, really? And he goes, uh, yeah, you're the combo player. And I was like, mm -hmm. uh, huh. I'm like, understood. And he immediately moves to his turn and he goes, I'll play my commander. And I was like, I'm under the assumption that you're going to attack me because you've been attacking me this entire time. So I would like to daze your commander because you've declared that you're going to be moving your resources towards me. And he kind of was like, hmm, yep. And I'm like, so I'll daze your commander. And I was like, I would have never dazed that commander without the knowledge of him saying, we need to get you off the table, mm -hmm. which is kind of like a unique aspect, right? Because like people share free information all the time in these all games. The time. All the time. And it was in that same game in round one, I attempted to do the same. I was like, please, aristocrat player, do not declare your resources at me. And that was the lightning bolt play I had. I was like, do not attack me with that. And yeah. he was like, ah, but you are the best person to hit. And I'm like, am I really? Mm -hmm. I'm the weakest link at the moment. Both of them are much better seated than I am. Malcolm is X amount of mana, and I'm just trying to survive against them. And he was like, but I could just slam into you. And I'm like, that's fair. Mm -hmm. Understood. And everybody was kind of like, he's trying to bargain with you, which means, and, you know, we had the, the whole dynamic. And the I was like, yeah, I was like, okay, I'll let you choose what you'd like, but I'm letting you know, please don't do it. That's, that's all I could say to you. And he goes, he turned it sideways towards me. Giant commander. And I was like, dome you in the face. Okay, this is over with. Let's move on to the next player because he's going to slam into me too because Cardor is no joke. That deck is very powerful. And Lobber's deck was doing a good job of holding it off, but there's only so many turns that you can we do. can hold them off. Yeah. So, so we made it to your round three. What about your round four? That was against my fellow co-host, Puzzle Box. Uh, mm -hmm. That was a very nail-biting round for me. Uh, truth be told, that was one, I knew I was against Puzzle, so I was already chewing my fingernails a bit. Uh, two, it was a, if I do not win, I may not make top. And I was like, oh, what is happening? And then the other round drew, which meant they both get top. And I was like, they drew? I have no, no chance. If yeah. yeah, I'm like, if I lose this, I can't top. I was like, oh, because I was also paired down. Mm -hmm. So any of them could beat me. And it kicks me out of top. And I was like, okay. 
I felt pretty good after seeing seat order. I was seat one. So I was like, okay, I'm seat one. So being seat one allows me to play, to be proactive. Mm. And I'll be brutally honest. As soon as I saw puzzle turn two go, uh, to make growth chamber, return my eye to my hand, discard down. I was like, oh no, puzzle has the sauce. I'm like, what can I do to slow him down? And like, I went straight tunnel visioned. I was like, okay, other two players at the table, I have to ignore you now. I know he has sauce. Mm -hmm. I have to stop this somehow. And the only way I thought I could stop it is presenting win myself. I was like, I have yeah. to try to win now. If I don't win, he wins. And for the record, he had uh, Stone, like, Stone Cedar Hierophant is the line he was. Oh, with. it was. Oh, it was busted. It, yeah. His turn, his turn three play was disgusting because he like uh, or turn four play was he was just like the Stone Horde. He was like, all right, uh, untap, play land, untap make land drop, play this, play... I was like, I'm like, oh, we are and he had, in so much trouble he had here. Gretchen, like, he had Gretchen on the battlefield, so with the Hierophant, uh, the the uh, land yeah. aura, you know, he was basically able to Gretchen every turn, every other person's yep. turn. So he yep. he was primed, he was What's ready. That? Oh, he had the enchantment in his hand. So he he sat on the enchantment. He left up to show he had interaction, which he did not, because I uh, actually peek at his hand um, during the turn that I win, because I was worried about him. And we go through this giant turn of interaction where he targets me, I target him, I we do this whole shenanigans thing, and I end up pulling it off against him. But I even spoke to him about it. I was like, look, man, I only win that game because I was seat one. Mm -hmm. Like, you had to respond to me. It was not the other way around. If I had to respond to you, I would have had to mole mm -hmm. in res to attempt to control you mm -hmm. instead of vice versa. And he really did a good job. In, in case you guys missed it, that's a nugget. You know, that's free coaching right there. Depending on where you are in seed order and who you're playing against in pod composition, then your mulligan matters. So if you're behind puzzle box in that situation and you're mulliganing to be proactive yeah you're wrong no you're wrong 100 percent. no i i mulligan to my seating and to the players i am also playing again mm -hmm. so then i do that every round um the round i won in round two i mold to five mm -hmm. and i mold to five with some gas and i was like this is going to be good. Uh, and then when Caitlin went turn one Dargo, I was like, even better hand. My hand just got way better. Mm -hmm. Like, and it, you know, you should be doing those things. Like, you should always be mulliganing to certain decks and or players at the table. I know I don't to say players, but realistically, you should understand if a player is known for a deck and they are playing that deck you should at least respect their presence mm -hmm. i know that's kind of a weird situation you don't just go after them right because that's a little bit off well, you also, don't want to just take them off the table also dallas puzzle playing gretchen um you and i have played with him a number of times to know that when he does xyz he's telegraphing now uh, the mm -hmm. the average person won't know that because they lack that that regular experience playing with him, but uh, that's what I feel when you say respect the player or mold to the player. You know that's what mm -hmm. I think that you're hinting towards is yes. you know what, definitely what you know them to likely be doing based on what they're you know where they're sitting in the pod composition. So yeah, definitely. And, and with, with puzzle playing Gretchen, uh, like I have to respect the power of that deck entirely. And I did respect the other two decks at the table. Um, one of the decks was the Orzhov deck, but I knew he was going to be attacking. And with a deck like that at the table, I understand that that deck is really 
kind of tied to the ground because they have to pick one of us to go after. And I have to bank on me or who are you going to choose at the table kind of aspect. And the Val deck, honestly, I had no idea what it was trying to do. I was just like, it's blue it was, black. Uh, it looked like a yep. uh, some sort of combo deck because Val produces uh, colorless based on the number of artifacts or uh, meant for artifact activation. So I think that looked it like... Was. It was. It was a very cool deck. It was very cool. I actually had a great conversation with the uh, player afterwards and it was an amazing deck. I love to see it. Um, I actually hope that they continue to work on it mm-hmm. and uh, kind of hone it a bit better. Um, it's not too far off. It's a blue-black control deck, mm. and it has some very powerful cards in it. So, Right on. All right, so in the next next four or so minutes, so that was round four, you had a round five, and then you had finals, or was it round, was round five? Round but, five finals. Okay, so... The finals. <clears throat> Fastest finals ever. (laughs) 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 It's funny. um, Listening, because I was laying in bed at this point, uh, because it was late, and uh, listening to the commentators. And commentators are silly, looking at you, Derek. Uh, Commentators are silly in the fact that they kind of ignore, like, the first round or so, like, round of play, you know, actions, what people are doing. Which is hilarious because i was watching and you you played a land and you played a uh, a lotus petal and then exiled a simian spirit guide and then put a turn one uh, malcolm into play and 30 seconds had passed by and derek was like is that a turn one malcolm and i was like yeah yes it is <laughs> <laughs> yes it is so yeah yeah, as as soon as you got that that set the momentum I feel uh like of of what was to transpire over the next couple of turns and I'll let you take it from here. Well, I mean, so it was pretty obvious, right? Once again, I'm in seat 1. In seat 1, I'm going to so that was my second 7. Um I actually took a picture of my first 7. Um the table of players was amazing. Like David, Chinaman, uh, Kunks, they were all great. We were all talking, have a conversation. My opening seven was gas, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Um, in seat one, I wanted to do one of two things. I wanted to either control the table, because I'm seat one, and Chinaman's deck is so good against mine, and I want to make sure that he can't ever establish himself. Stater Enchanter, I don't want you to establish yourself, so I'm going to take both your commanders off the field. Mm-hmm. Come to your seat four, you're slow. So because you're so slow playing Abdel, I'll get to you when I need to get to you. Mm-hmm. But because I'm seat one, I need to take care of the first two first. Like, I need to definitively handle your commanders. And I took a photo of my opening seven that I mulled back. And they were super nice. I took a picture with it, you know, my hands over the camera. You could see me taking a photo of it. They were super nice about it. And I showed it to them after the match. And I was just like, guys, I obviously I won. But I was like, I still think my first seven was keepable. Mm -hmm. And it was like a lightning bolt. It was just control pieces, like Mm -hmm. me stopping them from playing the game. And I was like, I wanted to go two directions, control or just blitz you razor fast yeah yep and my second hand was blitz you and i was like did it got it i'm going for it mm-hmm. franklin slow david slow the other malcolm could get me hopefully they don't cross my fingers sometimes you better be lucky than good mm-hmm. right that's a good old sport metaphor right mm-hmm. and I needed to draw the land. I top decked the island, and yeah, that's all she wrote. So that was turn three. Like I think it was under like three or four it minutes. Was, it was it was it was super fast. Yeah. So uh, the thought it had occurred to me. People will see it in the link when they go to look up the list. Now, if it wasn't obvious, uh, uh, Gator was playing Malcolm Kettis, which um, I wanted to kind of 
get through his perspective on the tournament, his perspective on the rounds, so that way we can hone in on this list. Now, uh, I try my best not to talk about me and my experiences when I do these things because this is all about you. And uh, like I'll allude to like something I've seen or done, but it's not really specific. I'm going to break that uh, now because I'm going to turn that back around. Uh, so Malcolm Kettis was one of the original like OG decks or commander set, you know, from way way back two years ago when you know the format was just picking up and what have you. Uh, the way that it was built back then, not throwing shade or names or anything like that, the way it was built back then, I personally was not happy with because I felt like Kedis uh, wasn't doing anything. And that version back then didn't have Fireweaver, uh, Artillerist, all that stuff. So in fairness, um, the way that I perce- perceived it and pursued it from there, this is the manifestation of the Malcolm Dargo uh, list that I'm known for i thought it was the better malcolm kettis list from back then because it gives you two commanders that do two different things now uh you heard it here first uh i am going to be most likely taking my malcolm dargo list apart and the reason why is i'm going to replace it with a version of this malcolm kettis and i'll tell you why because if malcolm dargo was my way of making the original Malcolm Kettis better, and which I feel like I succeeded, then Chris and his new invention of Malcolm Kettis has superseded what, what I was trying to do with Malcolm Dargo. Now, with regard to speed, so my Malcolm Dargo uses Knack, uh, and this has got me questioning Knack. Knack requires four combo pieces. Malcolm Kettis requires three. And one of those cards is in your command zone. So you have automatic access to one, and you just need to find, out of all the redundancy that you have in that deck, you just need to find the other two pieces, which, so, like, looking at it realistically, not to, you know, be the champion, like, I'm happy with what my... uh, you know, my list is done, but like giving credit where credit due is due, like the Malcolm Kettis, I feel is probably the, the best representation of, uh, Malcolm red as far as like speed consistency, you know, proactiveness. So I'll throw it back at you. Like, tell me, tell me how you arrived at this particular (laughs) list. I know other people have been working on it uh as well uh you know tell me more um so two two different things um so my daughter wanted to learn combo and i originally started making malcolm kettis for her because she's a fan of kettis mm-hmm. specifically kettis um you know dargo kettis right kettis mm-hmm. so malcolm kettis was the easiest thing to be like okay this is combo and then I built the version online uh, that I saw. It's got like 10,000 views. Um, I don't remember the name of the author, but it had a ton and ton of views. Um, Viridian Longbow, all that stuff was in the deck. And I played that deck. And I I thought that deck was just god-awful. I could not believe that deck was as bad as it was. Can't blame you. I could not win a game with it. Mm -hmm. I was just like, cool, guys. I'm going to counter everything everyone does. And then watch you guys beat me to death. Awesome. I eventually run out of counter. I can't counter three people. Like, this is insane. And then we looked at the deck more. And then uh, Chinaman was with me one day. And he was like, that deck looks good. And I was like, yeah, Arden should be the commander to this deck. Because this is silly. And he goes, I don't know if you're shit talking or not but that's a really good idea. And I was like, no, it's not. That's stupid. And then I was like, wait, you're right. That's actually a really good idea. (laughs) He goes, you made the idea. I'm like, oh, wait, you're right. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, let's do Malcolm Arden. And then we built Malcolm Arden off of that deck. And Arden was just so powerful. And it made that Malcolm Kettis deck disgusting. Like it turned into that. Because you still had all of the same pieces, but they were mm. white. Like, blades turned into shields, right? And, like, 
you got crib swap and you still had the same tutors and mm-hmm. it was just a better deck overall. And I was like, this deck's just better. And I was like, so what happened to Malcolm Kettis? So I kept playing Malcolm Kettis and I couldn't get it to work. Mm-hmm. And I was like, why can't I get this? This should be better. But I couldn't get it to work. And then I started going all the way back to the beginning with Dargo. I was like, why does Dargo work? And I was like, Goblin Matron. And then I looked at a few different other players' lists, like uh, Jonathan in his Roger list had Goblin Matron. And I was like, wow, that's literally brilliant. That's a demonic tutor for this deck. I'm like, I will play this. And I spoke to him about it. And I was like, yeah, I slotted it in. It was brilliant. And I said a few other cards in it. And I was like, this is the best Malcolm Red deck in the format, I think. Mm-hmm. I'm like, I think Breaches is good, but I think this is good. I think this is good. But like, I can't not present win by turn four every single game. I'm like, every single time I play this deck, I'm presenting win on turn four. I'm like, this deck is insane. And I just started playing and playing and playing and playing and playing. And I got a bunch of turn three wins. And I was just like, okay. Now, for the record, that was my first Reckless Fireweaver Trickery Charm win mm-hmm. ever. That was my first one. But in a majority the of the time, in a majority of the time, you're using one of the other like uh, instant and sorcery pingers using like a curiosity control. I think one of the matches that you were, uh, uh, I think it was round three, uh, you had a curiosity effect and you were just basically just storming and drawing and Looping. storming and drawing. Yep. Yeah. That's so, how I always win. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I always win like that because the pingers aren't threatening. If I put Reckless Fireweaver in play, it dies instantly every time. Mm-hmm. So, if it's not Re- Reckless Fireweaver, it's one of the other ones, I could still win the game with that. Just most people don't go, okay, that's not the one that literally wins the game. It's the one that could kind of win if he jumps through 15 hoops. Mm-hmm. Jumping through 15 hoops with that deck is not hard whatsoever. You're just like, oh, you're going to do that? Okay, look win the game they're like wait what they're like the, yeah try okay so maybe like, there's an opportunity to revamp malcolm dargo before putting it in the bin but i've already uh i've already uh copied the list uh of yours and uh i don't know there's there's a co- there's a there's a couple of flex spots in there that uh i'll be looking to play with uh based on my experience with uh malcolm red and that sort of stuff but like uh oh yeah it has flex slots it has i have 10 flex slots in the deck that are dedicated to current meta Mm -hmm. and it's those could all intertwine for whatever i need to play against like it like electric is easy example easiest example i could give you right Mm -hmm. like abdel is no joke and third path iconoclast is no joke and let's be realistic, there's so many other decks in the format that just have powerful 1-1s, one from dorks to just value creatures that you would like to get off the table. <laughs> Plain and simple. So, so, so Malcolm Kettis is pretty good. Um, it, it's it, good. It's... Uh, I think it has the opportunity to be one of those marquee lists, just like Gretchen, just like Abdel. You know, I think there's opportunity there. Um, uh, TPI, we're still working out. Uh, uh, I wanted to. I think the final thing that I wanted to touch on, because we're at uh, uh, fifty over fifty minutes, is. Uh, we talk a lot about players, and um, this is the part that I hinted to previous that uh, uh, I think you'd be uh, happy in the direction that we're going to go. So, like, uh, Puzzle Puzzle hasn't won a tournament for a while. Now, mm-hmm. what does that mean with regard to puzzle and his performance and his credibility and all of that stuff what is your perception of 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 dallas 
as a player based on his accolades and all the based off off of what I just said there. He's going to love that we used him I mean, as an example. I mean, the dude is a house. Like, I, I'm not too sure. Like, if he's sitting across from me, I will never ignore that. Like, the, I I went back and watched the, the video where they were talking about me and him and, you know, since we're co-hosts and whatnot with the common theory, they were like, it's really interesting to watch them kind of prioritize each other which is true mm -hmm. and he made a point to do certain things to me early game and vice versa mm -hmm. and we knew what we could do to each other and because one of our opponents mold and because the other opponent was tapped out mm -hmm. we knew what to do towards each other we were presenting win against each other throughout the game mm -hmm. and if I did not win the turn that I did, he showed the top of his library, which was a step through, yep. and won the game. Yeah. So if I didn't win, he, he won, won the game. Yep. So it just shows you how powerful and how much we know each other. Mm -hmm. So and I mean, honestly, he's an ins he's an amazing player. Like he, he knows is. what he's doing. He and knows I, the steps that. He and needs I to used take. him. I used him as an example because. Um, you and I have spoken over the last like months or two about uh, the validity, the credibility behind uh, participation in these events. Um, I use Dallas as an example, obviously, because I don't want to use myself as an example because I'm not self ingratiating. But uh, Puzzle, I agree. Puzzle is an uh, outstanding player. He's a phenomenal brewer. Uh, and the fact that he shows up to these events, he puts the skin in, he puts the time in, he battles. Oh, he's, yeah. not, he's not just sitting there like a fish, forgive the imagery, uh, doing, doing nothing. He's actively participating, and he has the respect of uh, his peers, his fellow participants, that sort of stuff. So, Well, uh, if, if I may, if yeah. I may interrupt you real quick. Yep. He did have the free entry to the event because he slaughtered the <laughs> slaughtered, I think is the proper word, the league. And he just did w what I did in the finals. He just was like, hey, guys. Turn three, turn four. I win. Yeah. Yeah. I, my phone was buffering to try to watch that. And by the time it was able to, I was able to catch signal. It had ended and I was like. Where is the game? Yeah. And I was so disappointed that I so, missed it. <laughs> so, and I think Chris will agree here, which is why I went through this long preface. Uh, so for those of you who are looking at this man, uh, seeing his successes, and, you know, you're interacting with him, you hear, you know, the you, you hear the legend, the juggernaut that uh, Chris has become, right? And then you think to yourself, like, okay, I'm not winning any tournaments. I'm not doing anything. Just show up. All you have to do is show, oh, yeah. show up and you'll have the respect. Uh, Bobby, Jonathan, Lotad, like you can, you can build a tremendous list of personalities of people, of players who show up to these events. I mean, hell, I, I went zero and three, you know, now to throw myself in there. Uh, I don't think I'm the best player. I don't think I'm the best brewer, but I show up, you know, I do the damn thing. I, you know, was in, I puzzle and I were kind of like a similar circumstances. First round Kunks was just demonstrating a win with Abdel. I tried to win on top of his win failed, you know? So like I'm, I was hanging in, I was doing the thing. I didn't win anything, but that's, I don't, I don't, it wasn't in the cards, you know, it's always these micro, very nuanced opportunities that determine whether or not you win or lose you mulliganing, uh, in that last round, you know, determined, yeah. determined the outcome of that game. So like, I mean, you gotta lose to be able to win, right? Like I have uh, look, look at, uh, aggro Aaron in the tournament. He was fifth place. He bubbled right out. 
Um, he was in it, win it in with Kunks to top four. He lost that round, but that was a deck that he has, I think, recorded over 42 losses with on the uh, data. And, you know, he showed up with that deck first time ever, a con uh, control style deck. And that's impressive to, to see someone go out of their comfort zone to play something like that. And it's always interesting to see these different players go so, out and absolutely. do so part of this, and I'm and I'm so glad that you than what their norm is. Yeah, and I'm so glad that you joined me for this because part of this is uh, I I want to be able to celebrate with you. This was uh, an amazing achievement. Uh, you know, if you do this every single time, I'm going to have to fly down to Miami and <laughs> and, and Nancy <laughs> Kerrigan you. But <laughs> but also like uh, I chose this moment, uh, unbeknownst to you, I chose this moment because I wanted to illustrate that, um, for anyone who doesn't think that you put the time in, uh, you are constantly networking with other players. You're constantly brewing with other players. You're constantly developing, uh, your, you know, your, yourself, your own decks, your daughter, other people, you know, as players and stuff like that. I mean, you're putting, you're putting in the work and that's paying off, right? So you're 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 oh, yeah, extending definitely. the effort and it's paying off. So uh, I wanted to, in on top of celebrating your your win, <clears throat> kind of like champion you a little bit, you know, lift you up on that pedestal and say, look, uh, you know, the other player who's looking at me, pointing at you right now. Uh, I'm not saying you have to grind the same way, you know, because he does. Chris does put in the grind. I've seen I've seen it myself. Uh, I'm not saying you got to do the exactly minute for minute what he does, but putting in the effort will yield results. And uh, hell, if you need, you know, coaching, uh, it's GatorBait T underscore TV <laughs> <laughs> on Discord. He's he's not on Twitter because uh, well, it's Twitter. Um, Common Theory. Uh, I'll 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 put a link to the channel in uh, in this video's <laughs> description. And yeah, like, uh, I knew I'm happy. I got to score the interview with you because I knew we'd be able to not only talk about the event. It was an amazing event. Uh, 20, you know, people, uh, be fine. Great job. Uh, Chris and I will be playing in another one this weekend coming up for another entity. Um, but yeah, man, like, uh, I, I, I appreciate you letting me, you know, talk you up a little bit you know not that you need me but you know i uh, know i definitely appreciate it, man it was uh i had a fantastic time and once again like the the turnout like the fact that there was so much variety in decks there was it was absolutely amazing so it was it was a great time and yeah always shout out to you know the pdh pod they did a great job commentating um I'm going to I'm going to hit this one hit this little note. Uh Derek Clay said stuff about you earlier. <laughs> Derek, you're my favorite one. Um, he is you're a, my favorite one, Derek. He is the so, most professional human being, of course, yes. So you yeah. you're my favorite one. Uh Derek and I have but, a little uh we we rib each other. Uh oh, that's kind of our relationship. So uh kind of my, rel not... my relationship with everybody, I guess. <clears throat> That's not saying I don't appreciate you, Brad or Alk, but I have to say, you know, Derek is just a little bit above. I, you know, <laughs> just just an iota, uh, just a wee bit, just a, a wee bit, you know. Yeah, right on. Yep. Okay, um, that's an hour. So, uh, tournament it's in the bag. Uh, you should be getting Bobby should be handling your payouts and all that stuff. You know, at some point in time, don't spend it all in one place, you bastard. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, what are you playing in, in the next tournament? Um, I am either playing Forex in Sensor or I'm playing Sybaris, one of the two Sweet. decks. So um, if you're, if, yeah, if you're watching this, participating in the uh, uh, Common Cause tournament hosted by uh, uh, Chris, one more game, and Alex Arnett of Trivial Counters, and uh, J Row, if you're if you're participating in that event next weekend. I'll probably be playing TPI, slightly modified from my experience here. He'll probably be on sensor. Now that you know, prepare. Yep. I mean, 
that's what I'm going to do. Like, it's one of the two decks. Um, I have proxies in both. So whatever I could get real from the two decks, that's what, uh, whichever one I end up getting the, the real cards for. So righteous. All right, my man. I'm hoping for sensor. Hoping for sensor. <laughs> All right, my man. I'm going to stop it here. And then, uh, maybe you'll be interviewing me next week. <laughs> there you go. Hey. hey, thank you so much for having me, Clay. I really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, hopefully we switch roles next week. Absolutely. I'd love to. I'd love to come uh, come to your house. Talk to you. All right, brother man. We'll catch you on the flip. Thank Peace. you. Thank you. Peace out, everybody. <laughs>